I'm ready for God's word. He's been pouring it into me this last week or so. Let's all stand this morning. We're going to reverence the word of God. Going to the book of Numbers, starting at verse 18, reading to verse 24. Numbers 23, 18. All right. Then he took up his oracle and said, this is Balaam, a prophet, speaking in regard to Israel. He said, rise up, Balak, who was the king of the Moabites, who hated Israel, and hear, listen to me, you son of Zippor. God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received it. I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He has not observed iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. He has strength like a wild ox. For there is no sorcery against Jacob nor any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, Oh, what God has done. The King James of that is, What hath God wrought? And lastly, in verse 24, Look, a people rises like a lioness and lifts himself up like a lion. It shall not lie down until it devours the prey and drinks the blood of the slain. Let's bow. Father, this word of yours excites me. It encourages me. It informs me and blesses me. And I thank you for it, Lord. I pray that it would be allowed to be injected into every heart for the encouragement of every listener. Father, do that and much more in the lives of every believer and encourage the unbeliever to come into your family soon, Lord, soon, we pray. In Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. You may be seated. Well, praise God. My message title this morning is, What Hath God Wrought? I'm going to go back in a moment and tell you, fill in some of the gaps there on that scripture that I gave to you, but it occurred to me, I've been been thinking about this subject, uh, Brother Terry, for, I don't know, two, three weeks been gathering and studying, and that saying, what hath God wrought? In other words, the, that's kind of Old Testament, or Old English, Middle English. What hath God wrought? What hath God done? Is what that means. And I thought, now that's a, that's a famous saying. I know it is. That is a famous saying in U.S. history. And so I went online and I typed in, what hath God wrought? Because I knew something about that. I'm a historian and something about that clicked in me. And I was right about that, that More than 170 years ago, a man named Samuel Morse, who was the inventor of the telegraph machine 
And the inventor of the code that people could send over wire from one place to another electrically and through the invention of the Morse code communicate from one person to another all the way eventually across the country. It was the first, if you will, texting. Before texting, there was the telegraph and the Morse code. Now, I just last night, yesterday afternoon, delved into that. And as I was looking at the history of that, I saw a date. And it talked about when this invention that Samuel Morse had brought to fruition, when it was first publicly revealed, it was revealed in Washington, D.C., in front of Congress, who was sitting there. He had urged Congress to finance him to put a machine in Washington, D.C., and another one over in Maryland, about 50 miles away, and said, we're going to demonstrate this machine for you. I looked at that closer, that story, and my eyes about bugged out of my head. This was last night. I was just stunned by this. I had to double and triple check it. That happened, that moment in Congress happened 176 years ago today. May 24, 1944. Now this message was already developed and coming together before I knew that. I was going to preach this message today no matter what. But to find out that this is the anniversary when the telegraph was publicly revealed. A little background here on Samuel Morse. He was the son of a reformed pastor. He was married to a woman that he really loved. He was in Washington, D.C. several years before this. He was a painter. He was becoming a famous, renowned painter. Important people, past presidents and so on, and current famous people were asking him to paint his portrait. He was in Washington, D.C. several years before this, and a word came to him, a message. She lived many miles from home. And the message said, come quickly. Your wife is very sick and she may be dying. He immediately dropped everything. I don't know if got on a horse or took a carriage or whatever. And he flew home as fast as he could to get there and to find out that his wife had died in that amount of time and even had already been buried. It broke his heart. And he lamented the fact that he was not able to get home and see his wife before she died. It's a little bit later, a few years later, that he got this idea to work on the telegraph. He thought, so we can get messages to people very quickly without that kind of delay. Somebody said that necessity is the mother of invention, and and that's such a true statement of many cases. So think about this now. I want to get back to this. I I, I love to teach history. I think probably you recognize that. But something I love even more is to be able to teach and preach the Bible. To me, that has eternal results. I want to get back to the Bible. So, in order to demonstrate this new invention and this new machine, 
They needed to be able to send a message through Morse code to receive it there and then to send it back. And so he could pick anything he wanted to say. The man who was a friend of his that had been at university with him, at Yale I think they both went to, had become the head of the patent office in Washington, D.C. He had a 17-year-old daughter that Samuel Morse was fond of. And he came to her and he said, Honey, he said, I'm going to let you pick what I send as a message. What would you like? And she picked Numbers chapter 23, verses 23, the four words, What hath God wrought? And that's what he sent. Now I look throughout the Bible. The Bible talks about wrought. Talks about God doing certain things and uses the word wrought several dozen times in the Bible. But I don't know that I could find any other place that had it worded just like that. What hath God wrought? And it wasn't Moses that spoke that in praise to God. It wasn't Aaron, it wasn't David, it wasn't Samuel, it wasn't Isaiah or one of the great prophets, it wasn't Elijah or Elisha, it was a man by the name of Balaam who was a prophetic mercenary, meaning that he prophesied for money. Not unlike those who fashion themselves to be fortune tellers today who will tell you your fortune, allegedly, if you pay them some money. Some of these people, charlatans or not, God knows, have become wealthy by their so-called prophetic ability. He was that kind of person. His gift if you want to call it that, was real. It was authentic. The people in all of the region of the Midianites and the pagans of that time, as Israel was passing on their way to the promised land, toward the end of that 40-year sojourn, they were not far from going over into the promised land, and they were there in the land of Baal, the land of the Midianites, in the land of someone by the name of King Balak who was the king of Moab, which represented the god Moab in all of the horrible, desecrating kind of worship, even to the point of sacrificing their infant children to their god Moab. And so here came Israel, all two or three million of them, squatting, He's thinking on their land, his land, and so he can't do anything about it. They're too large for him to conquer. They're too many for him to defeat. So he calls Balaam. He says, I want you to come, and I want you to curse this people because he had a reputation for being able to curse. And people would pay him great sums of money to perform a curse. You know that's still being done today? Especially if you get down to places like Haiti, which is filled with demon worship. I mean, Haiti has been known for that for hundreds of years. There are other countries, some in Africa and different places, where people, witch doctors, and so on, sorcerers, are paid to curse you. In fact, we don't have to go to Haiti. We don't have to go to Africa. Right here in West Michigan, there are people you can find, if you're looking for them, you can pay them to curse somebody. You say, I don't believe in all of that. Well, then throw the Bible out. It's an enterprise, legitimate or not in our minds. And so he said, I want you to come. And, and, and Balaam was a mercenary. 
He was greedy for money. And Balak had riches and was able to endow him with much money and honor and all of that. Just come and curse this people. So Balaam came and he stood up on that hill and he opened his mouth to curse Israel. And what comes out? A blessing. Balak is furious. And he goes before Balaam and says, what are you doing? I'm paying you a large sum of money to come here and curse my enemy. And Balaam says, didn't I tell your people that came to get me to start with that I can only prophesy and speak forth what God, Jehovah, gives me to speak? Didn't I tell you that? Balak is discouraged, he's frustrated, he says, let's try it again. And Balaam says, all right, let's try it again. And so do twice the sacrifices you did before to your God, Baal. And he went up on another mountain and he opened his mouth to curse Israel and out came forth another blessing. I read that blessing to you this morning. I want you to go back and focus on that verse 23 again because it's really, really good. It's very, if you will receive this, it's very pertinent to every believer that's in this building and that will be hearing this by YouTube. Very important. It says for, listen to this. This is Balaam prophesying what God is putting in his mouth to say, there is no sorcery against Jacob. No sorcery. Nor is there any divination against Israel. It now must be said of Jacob and of Israel, oh, what God has done, or what hath God wrought. Look at the blessings of of God and no sorcery will be allowed to be spoken against my people. You may be sitting there and say, well, that's Israel. What's that got to do with me? Don't you know that if you are a person of faith who believes in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, your personal Savior, your God who loves you, do you not know in that instant you become a child of Abraham and the blessings of Israel belong to you and me. Therefore, what do I obtain from that? That being I am a child of Abraham, I'm a child of Jacob. No one can curse me. Yeah, some of you think that's good news. Some of you, I'm not sure. I think that's powerfully good news. I love Isaiah 54, 17. We're familiar with this scripture, I know. It says, no weapon formed against you shall, shall prosper, and every tongue which rises against you in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is from me, says the Lord. You cannot be cursed, you cannot be slandered, you cannot be hurt, for you will rise up in judgment against them, and my righteousness, which I have, I give to you. You have the righteousness of God. Can you say amen, somebody? No one can curse you. Now I need to bring a caveat into this. We need to understand the good with the bad. What I just gave you was the good. There is a flip side to that in the sense of the bad. I preached a sermon a couple of months ago. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Now we're going to talk about the bad just for a moment. The only person, you need to hear the saints. Because some people are saying, man, 
I'm ready to see some of this blessing. You know, I have to be careful, and Nancy cautions me. Nancy cautions me a lot. She said, Doyle, you need to be careful about talking too much about the blessings of God in your life. Me personally, I love to talk about the blessings of God. But she said, you need to be careful. I said, why is that, honey? She said, not everybody likes that, Doyle. Especially if they're not enjoying that. They don't want to hear about your blessings. Now, I get it, and I understand what my wife is cautioning me to be, and I do tone it down, believe it or not. I do. You couldn't stand me if I really turned loose. I'm not saying everybody in this building feels that way, but I know that's true. I've encountered that, that pushback that says, good for you, where's mine? You know what I tell them? God is not a respecter of persons. He's got blessings untold. He's a generous God. He's a good God. And he doesn't care what your last name is. He doesn't care what color your skin is. He doesn't care what your pedigree may or may not be. If you're a child of God, he loves you and he wants to bless you. That's that's what I tell people. But there's the bad to this. I've experienced this as well, personally, and by observation. The only person that can curse you is you. It's me. Robin, I can't curse you. If you weren't a child of God, I could. I have the capacity. Each of us has the capacity to curse and bless people. Now, I don't say that too often because I don't want people getting all full of themselves about that. I don't want them testing that to any great degree. You know what I'm saying? But as a believer, I cannot curse you. The only time that I could curse you is if I try to curse you and you receive that curse. I had a woman come in here a couple of years ago. You've heard me tell it. She came up to me and cursed me to my face right here in this spot. Pointed a finger at me and cursed me, and told me all the bad things that were getting ready to happen to me. And I recoiled at that, and I said, in Jesus' name, I reject that. I reject that. I said, I'm not receiving any curse, but the blessings of God are upon me. And I tell you, the blessings of God did stay on me. And I would, none of what she, what she cursed and pronounced over me came of that. Now, if I said, oh, Lord, really? Oh, oh, what am I going to do? Oh, God, help Doyle. He's he's been cursed. You can't curse me unless I accept that curse, unless I verbalize that curse, unless I start cursing myself in what I say about myself. Oh, I'm a loser. Oh, I'll never amount to anything. My daddy told me, daddy might have cursed you, but you don't have to accept that curse. Reject the curse that mom or dad might have placed on you. You'll never amount to anything. Oh, you'll never do anything. Oh, you're just going to be a failure in your life. Oh, God, I don't accept any of that. Do you? People have tried that before on me. I don't receive it. I've had people, when I was in business, I came out of the block smoking. I mean, what? They got worried about me overnight. Those people that had been at the top of the heap, and all of a sudden, here comes Doyle, and blessings are coming. 360 degrees to me, all oh, some of them hated me because of the blessing of God that was upon me. And they tried to curse me and they tried to undermine me. You think that had any effect? No! What that curse just kept bouncing back off of me onto them. Amen? Anybody getting what I'm saying here this morning, y'all? Come on, I know we haven't been together too much lately. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
So, there's another way you can curse yourself. And this is the bad. If you, if you want to enlist to it, it's, it's up to us. Here's the, here's the thing. To be blessed or cursed is up to us. God has said, and he said it to Joshua, and he said, here the Lord is, and today he presents you blessing and cursing. Choose you which one you want to have. He said, as for me and my house, we choose the blessing, which means serving Almighty God and putting idols far from us, worshiping no other God but Jehovah. We get to choose whether we want to be blessed or cursed. Balaam, who, by the way, ended up dying a very violent death, did eventually, and I'm sure he got a reward in it, tell Balak how to undo the blessings of God that were upon Jacob. And this is what he told them to do, in effect. He said, throw a party like only you can, Balak. One thing about you, boy, you can throw a party. Lots of alcohol, I'm sure lots of alcohol, drugs, whatever else. Lots of loose women. Bring in a lot of loose women that are just loose and will sleep with anybody. And get them, get them a little drunk. Get these women out here dancing with hardly any clothes on. Begin to entice them. Begin to draw them into this, uh, Balak. And before you know it, these people that are so sober now, these people who are so righteous now, they will begin to worship your gods. So what does Balak do? He goes, I'll try it. So they plan a party. They sent an emissary and a group over to Israel and said, we're having a little get-together, a little welcome wagon to welcome you into the land. We'd like you to come over, and we're just going to have a little get-together. And they came, and that's exactly what happened. And the men saw the women, and they were enticed, and they began to, because really, Baal's worship was all about sexual promiscuity and of the most perverse kind of sex that one could imagine. And they were drawn into that. And what happened? Let me tell you what happened. You can read it for yourself. This isn't Doyle's book. It's God's book. A plague broke out among them. And they were getting some of these Israelites, even some of the princes of Israel, were getting very cavalier and flamboyant in their sin. They were having a little meeting there. There was a plague breaking out all over Israel. People were dying. Here comes a prince of Israel. He comes walking right through the midst of the camp where the leaders had gathered behind him. It's this little Midianite woman that he's taken with him by the hand. They go into his tent. They immediately begin to have sexual relations. One of Aaron's sons, the fire of God, rose up in him. The wrath of God rose up into that man. He took his sword. He went running into that tent and he drove a spear right through both of their bodies. You said, boy, that's violent. It's what it took because then God began to stay the plague in which tens of thousands of Israelites had died. Let me tell you something. And I know this is strange doctrine to some. This is rarely preached anymore in the 21st century, I've noticed. But God still hates sin. And God does not tolerate sin in his people. We are so cavalier about sin. I see it. I talk to a lot of people. I'm an observer of humanity. and I see people who are just like, oh, it's okay, man. The blood covers it. I'm good. That's a doctrine that has been propagated into the late 20th and and early 21st century church, especially here in America. But I want to read you some, some quick scriptures that have to do, because Balaam is mentioned at least three times in the New Testament. Somebody say, I want New Testament. 
All right. I give it to you. Second Peter. Go to Second Peter, second chance. Hang with me now. I'm going to try to stay. I'm preaching a little bit longer than I've been preaching lately, but I'm going to finish in a very timely manner. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 12. This is Peter. Speaking about the last days, the days we happen to be in. He said, but these, talking about these presumptuous, self-willed teachers and preachers in the church, these, like natural brute beasts, made to be caught and destroyed. Now, this is New Testament. Peter speaking this. They speak evil of the things they do not understand and will utterly perish in their own corruption and will receive the wages of unrighteousness as those who count it pleasure to carouse in the daytime, right in the light of day, to carouse, to give themselves over to sin and sinful activities. They are spots and blemishes carousing in their own deceptions while they feast with you. They will be among you in the church. Having eyes full of adultery and that cannot cease from sin, enticing unstable souls. Think about that a moment. Unstable souls. They have a heart trained in covetous practices and are accursed children. Did Yeah, I gave you verse 15. Go to 15, now we see it. And they have forsaken the right way and gone astray, talking about what was to come, the last days. What are they doing? They are following the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages, of unrighteousness. So that's what the last days is, and they're going to be right among you in your feast amongst you. I'm going to comment on that in just a moment, but let me read Jude 11 now. This is Jude, the book right in front of Revelation. The prophet Jude In his one chapter book, in verse 4, notice what he says. For certain men have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation. Ungodly men, listen, please give heed, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on, as you read on in it, it's only a chapter long, he speaks of Balaam in the same way that Peter spoke of Balaam, he speaks of Balaam, that they will be amongst us in our feast, having the sin of Balaam in their lives. Verse 11, we see this. It says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, That's another subject. Have run greedily in the era of Balaam. Why? For profit. And perished in the rebellion of Korah. That's another subject altogether. Of Balaam. The era of Balaam. Why? So that they could make profit. So they could become enriched. Well, this is going over like a lead balloon, but I'm going to keep preaching. Let's move another book forward, a couple of chapters forward. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. All right, we'll be bringing it to an end here. This is Jesus now speaking, and he's speaking specifically to the church at Pergamos, who we had some issues with, This Pergamos is a demonstration of what some churches are going to look like in the last days. One of the things he says, he said, I got a few things against you in verse 14. 
because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before, listen to it, before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Somebody might say, well, how do you interpret that, Pastor Doyle? What does that mean? You don't have to be a Bible scholar to know what that means. Just read it. To eat things sacrificed to idols, to be idol worshipers, and to commit sexual immorality. He said, that's going to be, in the last days, the doctrine of Balaam that he had, that spirit on him, will be upon the church in the last days. What is that doctrine of Balaam? I would tell you what it is. You know, when Jude talked about grace, turning the grace of God into lewdness. What does that mean? What does lewdness mean? Do you, King James is lasciviousness. I like the word lasciviousness better. I think it carries more weight even than lewdness. The grace of God into lewdness. So what are you talking about, Pastor? What is, what is he talking about? What is he, what's Jesus talking about? It's very simple. He said, in the last days, there's going to be preachers all over, and they're feasting among you, and they're making money off of you, and what they're saying to you is that the grace of God is so great, you can live your life out any way you want. God doesn't see your sin. He sees the blood of Jesus, and you can go right on living your life the way. You said, that's not what, oh, yes, it is is by the scores, by the thousands that's being taught to us. You can't believe the people I run into that adhere to that. They've been taught that doctrine of Balaam. They believe that doctrine, that there's not anything I could do to ever, in any way, cause me to be out of disfavor with God. and I can live my life just like I want that is the doctrine of devils. That's the doctrine of Balaam. God did not send his only begotten son to die a cruel death on the cross and shed out all of his blood for you so that we can go right on living the way we've been living before Christ. You tell me one thing that's good about that. I tell this to people that believe this. I say, don't you understand? Sin is not good. Sin is bad. Sin is not holy. Sin and unrighteousness is evil and ungodly and unbeholden to be in the life of a believer. Read what John says in the first book of John about these things. He's so specific. He said, yes, we may occasionally stumble, but if we do, man, get back, get out of the mud and get back and repent. I've had people look me right in the face and say, I don't need to repent. I'm good just the way I am. I just accepted by faith the blood of Jesus Christ, and now I go right. It's a doctrine of devils. It's a doctrine of Balaam. And it's out there on the radio. It's out there on the television. Now, they cloak it better than I am this morning. But it's still what it is. You say, are they all wrong? No, because they're not all preaching that. But I'll tell you what, it's, this is a fact. When I run into a ministry, a national or, or international ministry, that actually preaches the truth of God the way I was raised in it to believe, I am stunned and almost in disbelief. And I'll contact them. i say, do you guys really believe this? And I have to go back to him two, three, four times before I'm convinced because it's so rare to find that ministry out there that preaches a holiness message, the one that I was taught growing up, the one that I adhere to and believe to this day. You guys are acting like I've never preached like this before. Okay, let me, let me bring it home. <laughs> Listen, if I told you everything this morning that's been going through me and all the stuff that I want to tell you would be here for a long time, but I know better than that. Here's the deal. 
Going to, I'm going to finish it with this scripture, Isaiah chapter 1. This tells it so plainly. I hope this hasn't stunned any of your senses. But I don't know how else to do this, but just preach it from my heart. Verse 18, we love this scripture. It's very prophetic regarding Jesus. It says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, right? All of our sins were dark and ugly and like scarlet. They shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient. What? I don't have to be obedient, man. I'm covered by the blood. Really? I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not willing to accept that gamble. And it's a bad gamble. Yes, I believe absolutely in the efficacy of the blood of Jesus to take away my sins. That's Bible. I believe it a thousand percent. But if you think that comes without a price, and that God doesn't not ask of us, but demand of us obedience and repentance, you missed something in the, in the process. You stumbled. You forgot to get into that. He says, if you're willing and obedient, then you shall eat the good of the land, but if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So there's that decision again, in the valley of decision. I wish I could talk to you this morning, everything I've been learning about David and King Saul and the difference between the two. But everybody makes their own decision. David made his decision. Saul made his decision. And what they received was just fruit as their rewards. Now, I need to confess something. This message did not start out as the title, What God Hath Wrought. This started out, it was just a thought that came to me one day, what hath coronavirus wrought? Because I could discourse on that for a long time, on my observation in the last three months or so. But God began to convict me. The Holy Spirit said, don't give coronavirus any credit. And that's not what it says. I looked in the, um, I'm kidding here, but I looked in the concordance, and I didn't see coronavirus in there, in the Bible. So I couldn't do, so that's when I changed it, what hath God wrought? This pandemic has presented a fork in the road for us. This is what I'm noticing. Now, this is anecdotal. Other than my personal observations, I have no way to tell you what's going on otherwise. So it's just a personal observation. But you need to hear this, I believe. The good, the people who were pointed in the right direction when this started are getting better. The people who had started pointing the wrong way when this pandemic hit are getting worse. We are coming to that place. I've been prophesying this for over 40 years now. That in the last days, there's going to be a separation of the sheep and the goats, and there's going to be a, a, a delignment of between the two, a division between the two. They're going to separate... The goats and the sheep are not going to mix anymore. They're going to be going their separate ways. And I'm observing that in people's lives. And those that were pointed toward the bad are getting worse. Those who were pointed toward godly and righteousness are getting better. I don't know what you've been seeing. I, I'm just telling you. I talk to a lot of people, and that's what I've been seeing. And I also heard this this last week. It said when we're listening to the news, and I know some people aren't here this morning. And we love them, and we don't condemn them that aren't here. But some of them aren't here because they are so fearful because they've been watching CNN 24-7. You are not going to build your faith watching CNN 
or any of the others for that matter, for the most part. Some are a little better than others. Folks, there's a fork in the road here. Somebody said, you know, this was years ago when people read newspapers. I'm still one of those guys that read newspapers, although I've not been buying any newspapers lately. One gets sent to me every day. Sometimes somebody gives me one. I've stopped buying them. You know why? Because every single page cannot have anything on it but coronavirus. Like nothing else is going on in the world. Everything colored by corona. I'm so sick of it. I'm a newspaper reader. I used to read three to four newspapers a day. I've stopped buying them because I'm so sick of it. Years ago when people read newspapers, a minister got up, he said, put a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other. And he said, that which you read in the newspaper, interpret by the Bible. What are people doing today? They're reading the Bible and then interpreting it according to what the newspaper says. God forbid! Those people out there, the great majority of them on TV and radio and and the newsprint and all of that and the internet, they're not out to build your faith. They're out to to drag down your faith. What's the point of all this, Pastor? I don't know if I could be any more plain. No one at my funeral, if, if the Lord lets me die in the Lord and not in the rapture, at my funeral, nobody will say, nobody will say, well, I'll tell you one thing about that pastor. You never knew where he was standing. You know, that guy, you just never knew what he was thinking. You'll never hear anyone say that about me. Like it or not, I'm going to tell you what God is giving me, the best I can possibly do through this flawed servant. So some of the stuff you didn't like, spit it out, I guess. Folks, here's the last question. This coronavirus has been a test. I could really go into that for a while. I'm not going to. I want to. It's been a test. It's testing us. You think we've really been through it? Oh, man. I'm a historian, and I can tell you, we haven't scratched the surface of what we could be going through and what many cultures and generations have gone through. I'm reading a book right now about World War II, England, 1940s. Almost every day, the Nazis are flying over at their Air Force and dropping millions of pounds of bombs, obliterating whole cities in England. And all the mess that came from that. Disease, death, and destruction. You ain't seen nothing yet. You think, oh, I'm suffering in this corona. (laughs) I'm not disdaining the people that have been very sick with coronavirus. That's serious and it's real. I thank God that we've been kept healthy. Amen? Aren't you thankful? Brother Raw, you're thankful? God's kept you and your family. Safe and healthy. And I know some of your family had direct exposure to coronavirus. But God kept you healthy, didn't he? Kept those grandbabies healthy. Praise God. I'm thankful. But I tell you, we ain't seen nothing yet. If we get to the ugly, then we can write our own book about what we've been through. But it's a test. Are you passing? Are we passing the test? Would you stand with me? I went over a little bit long today. It was not my intent. But if that was a problem, just thank God that I didn't preach all that I wanted to preach. Maybe I'll get to some of that next week. Would you bow your heads with me? We had a video in here, yes, uh, Friday, I guess it was. They came in and did a videotape on doing an introduction of the church to anyone that would like to go online and see what our church is about. One of the things I did when we got into this sanctuary is I picked up this Bible, 
And I said, if you want to know what our doctrine is, open the book, because this is our doctrine. This is what we believe. This is our catechism. This is our rules of order. This is what we believe. I'm going to maintain that until the day I die. I've gone too far to look back or turn back. Bow your heads with me. Father, it's been a really interesting week, and you've taught me so much. I thank you for that, Lord. I hope, God, when I've encountered some tests this week, I'm just hoping that I pass those tests. And if I did not, Lord, correct me so that I may learn for the future. But I want to pass every test because the final exam is coming when every person will stand before the throne of God and give an account of themselves. And I know that's coming. And that's why, Lord, I'm trying my level best to be as obedient as I possibly can. I pray, Lord, that that would have a widespread movement amongst the people of God. And those that have it now, Lord, will begin to infect other people. And that we see a pandemic of righteousness begin here in this church and in West Michigan and going through Michigan and throughout across the country and the world. I pray, God, that there be such an infection of righteousness and holiness and zeal for your house that it will be something that will stun us and stir us to action, to the glory of God. Now, Lord, I pray for everyone that heard this message, either via YouTube or that were here present this morning. I pray the Spirit of the living God will begin to activate in each one of us in such a way, God, there'll be no doubt of who we are and what we stand for, that there'll be no more middle of the road, but that we will get to the left or the right, choose, make a decision. I'm going to serve God with all I've got, or I'm going to go the other way and serve flesh. Choose one or the other. God, I pray that that would go far and wide to your glory and to your praise. And I ask, Lord, if there's anyone here this morning in that valley of decision who's doubting, say, I don't know what to do, I pray that right now they would pray a heartfelt prayer, something like this. Heavenly Father, forgive me for my sins. Cleanse me of unrighteousness. Cleanse me of those habits that I've been indulging in that I know are ungodly. And do not speak well of a child of God. God, nobody knows about some of these things but you and me. But I want, you, I want to confess that it's wrong, it's sinful. Forgive me, cleanse me, and empower me to walk righteously, to toe the line on that straight and narrow road that Jesus spoke about that very few find their way to. God, I want off the broad way and on the narrow road. Help me, because I cannot help myself. I need help that comes from you. And in Jesus' name, I believe that help is on the way, that I'm going to turn around and pass the test that I am currently having in my life. Hey, folks, it could be anything. It could be drinking to excess. It could be it could be not being truthful to people, telling these lies that God does not approve of. It could be lust and moodness and things like that. There's so many things that we encounter that we have to decide, will I go down this road or not? God is willing to help you put the brakes on and say, come back, run back to me. I'll receive you. I'll forgive you. I'll accept you. You'll be restored if you run to me and humble yourself. So God, I pray this. I've done the best I can. I've done all I know to do today. So Lord, bless it now for your glory. Speak to every heart as it suits you. In Jesus' name.
name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I'm glad you were here today. I hope you didn't come to see a reed shaken by the wind. It's, it's not what I've been called to. The Lord bless you as you go.